This special podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour is about listener questions. And we were challenged by someone who actually appeared at the New Enlightenment Radio Network studio from South Dakota, actually from Germany, but by way of South Dakota, and said, more questions. And so you gathered some because we get tons of them. We do. And I, re- I, 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 I am telling the truth when I say I read every one of them. But we had some really good questions for President Jefferson this And some week. challenges about potential bias in this program. And you know, I'll just say this, that the, the advent of Donald Trump as president has has put everybody off their center of gravity. That's true. We're having a kind of national nervous something, not collapse, but I, a, I, be, an incident. Even more than that was my faux pas about where Mr. Hancock was from, and I was so embarrassed. Well, that was a simple factual error. Yes, it was. But But I like it when our audience reminds us of our errors, because how else would we know? You know, there's this illusion that we know what we know, <laughs> <laughs> but we know better. Uh-huh. We're just winging it. Um, we had questions about ocean voyages. That was really fascinating. Fun. Yeah. Um, about uh, how long it took for Jefferson to think about the uh, Declaration of and, Independence. And, and did he really learn Spanish in 19 days? Come on. Yeah, that was a good one, I don't too. think so. Yeah, I don't think so. No. Um, we asked uh, Mr. Jefferson about his policies on immigration. And you know what? It was the same business then because there's always a class of people, in this case it was French radicals, that some elements of this country do not want here. There's This has been Irish, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Eastern Europeans, Italians, Slavs. If you look at the history of immigration in America, almost no generation has passed without there being a, a victim symbol nation who's infiltrating the country, who is undermining our – our our processes and, and I, I asked Mr. Jefferson if you know the common use of immigrants as the bad guys to drum up support and he he in conf- his time it was Haitians uh, white white it, Haitians right. who were fleeing from Haiti during the Black Revolution there uh, and also French radicals who were coming over as um, refugees from the French Revolution and the Federalists thought nuts to that these people are all radicals they're going to they're going to da- endanger this country what i really liked from jefferson was that he pointed out that america was a place that was a a, a safety net um, or how did he put it it's yeah much it's like than... a, a beacon to the world but but david where when did your kin come to this country in the 1800s, early 1800s. My kin came well, no, and I in the late say that. Some 1800s. Of them did. I, I'm actually related to Governor William Bradford. Oh, my. So everybody came from somewhere except Native Americans, and they came from somewhere too, but long, long ago. My people came from Germany in the 1880s and 90s. I would love to see their paperwork. See, I'm such a mutt. I, I could, you know, it's Sweden, Germany, France, Irish, English, Scotch. Most of the people who were uh, seen as... Um, undesirables Uh have fully assimilated into our system over time. The statistics are staggering. Well, I I really like Jefferson's answer on that. I thought it was very, very good. Well, Jefferson believed it was a whole different time. We were underpopulated. And there was a sense in which there was a vast empty canvas to be filled up with people. Uh, but, But my point is that there were struggles and debates and fierce partisanship even then about the nature of immigration. And I will point out that we're recording this program on July 17th, 2018. Um, we're pre-recording a couple of programs because you're off at this moment probably fighting for your life in the current. You know, the river's running high, David. You know, I know that this, this was a big water year. Yeah. And when I, when I called— And you're going to be in a kayak? I'm really? going in a kayak. You sure time. about that? Yeah. And wear a life jacket? Of course, I always do. But the river's running very high. Could My, be a lot of work paddling up that river. Yeah, well, it's the other way around. We're going yeah. downstream. Of course. And, but on the second day, I always say to everyone, turn your canoe around and paddle for five minutes towards Idaho. And they say, whoa, no one would do this. Nobody would do this. I bring this up to uh, wish you a good voyage, and I expect to see you in a few weeks suntanned and full of stories. But to, before we go, two things. Each of us got a splendid gift this week. I yeah. got from your father, Jack, yes, a small Macmillan Pocket Classics uh, edition of Roosevelt's yes, writings. We're moving him out of his and apartment. You, and you, yeah, and, go and, ahead. No, we're moving him out of his apartment, and he had a small collection of old books that he was sending off and to he people. He sent me one, and he said, "You know, I think Clay should have this." And that's so cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I thank him for and me. And I got a copy of Cannery Row by uh, Steinbeck from Russ Eagle. Um, he's writing. I had to smile when I heard you mention 
on a recent podcast that Cannery Row might be your favorite Steinbeck work. And it's, this is a, you know, on the back it says, buy war bonds. It's a, it's a, so it's a World War II. It's a first edition. Yeah, and it's, um, I, boy, I, I, I think I'm going to have to write him. I'm going to have to complain, you know. I've been with. I was hesitant to let you. I've see known it. Russ for a long time, and everywhere I turn, he gives somebody a copy of something. I was hesitant. You know, to, I get squat to to give it to you because I was afraid if I left the room, I have I, I have hauled Russ up Mount Whitney. You know, I had to haul Russ up Mount Whitney. Easy. Yeah, and and everybody, Sarah, you, everybody gets a copy of something. And I get on, squat. And on to the show. Go, Russ, go. And on to Thanks the show. Thanks a lot, Russ. Thank you. There will be no fruit cocktail next time. And there's really no time to do one of my... No, you better do a little one. I just want to say thank you very much to those of you who listen and... The more the merrier. And Russ, really? Really, Russ? And especially to those of you who have decided to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Donate, and you can help keep the Jefferson Hour on the air. And we really appreciate it. And with that, let's go to this week's show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. But seated across from me now is Thomas Jefferson. Very good to see you, sir. Good day, my dear citizen. Mr. Jefferson, I thought we might take some time to uh, respond to some questions from your many listeners this week. But before we do, I must ask how things are at Monticello. I'm I'm in the midst of a very happy gardening season. I hope you are too, sir. Well, I kept very accurate records, and I can tell you that things are flourishing uh, in the long, long terrace. You know, it's uh, 300 yards long. was built by slaves on the south face of my little mountain. Uh, it was a perfect garden for me, and I actually engineered it so there were places that had more shade and were better protected, places protected during cold weather, and places protected against the, the intense summer heats uh, at Monticello. And so this was one of my favorite things, was to go out in the evening into my garden and putter about and um, collect some of the harvest uh, to bring vegetables back into the house, particularly garden peas. And so gardens uh, automatically matter to me. As you know, sir, we've talked about this before. Your gardens have been restored. They have some excellent gardeners tending them these uh, these days. And tens of thousands of Americans visit Monticello every year and, and view your gardens. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that they're keeping them up because... If you ask me, what can you take away from your life and it still be your life, Mr. Jefferson? Uh, One thing you can't take away is the agrarian. I believe that farmers are the chosen people of God. I believe that having our hands in the soil is the greatest redemption that humans can know. I think that farming and gardening make us independent in spirit. They give us confidence. Uh, They, in a certain sense, keep us from being too dependent on Mr. Hamilton's uh, consumer economy. And so gardening has not just a, a place in my life as a hobby. I regard it as essential to the idea of a republic. You, sir, had a way of, of managing time, to find time for all of these things. And that leads into my, my first question from a listener this week from Daniel Molina. He writes, I do so highly admire your character as well as your extremely varied education and interests. There are many things that I would like to ask you, but so as to not take up much of your time, I will keep this interaction on the less intrusive side. I would find myself delighted if you could indulge me with insight as to how you managed your time. I wrote a letter to my daughter, Martha. I took a very special role in her education because her mother had died in 1782, and I wanted Martha to be well-educated as a companion to me in my adulthood, as a companion to her husband, whoever it should be, and also as the primary educator of her young children. And I said, never waste a single moment. He who never wastes a moment will never complain of a want of time. It is amazing how much we can do if we are always doing. It's really that simple. A rigid, disciplined schedule. Get up before the sun every day. Write your letters early. Make sure there is time for reading books. 
all of the projects make sure that they have a, a sequencing and they each get the attention that they need. Uh, but a rigid domestic routine, long hours at a desk, never wasting a single moment, that's the key to life. He goes on in his letter to talk about how he recognizes that uh, being president is one of the most taxing positions in existence and that he knows your life was quite taxing prior to your term as president, but that you were able to, to quote, tend to your tasks, read many books in a variety of languages, engage in fruitful scientific thought, the arts, agriculture, and ask how you managed to do all that. Well, it sounds as if you answer that, Mr. President, and, and the simple one-word answer is discipline. And the other answer is organization. You know, I kept five daily diaries, and I put data into each of them. I was in, incredibly well organized. I knew where every letter that I had ever written was. Uh, it was filed perfectly. I knew where every letter that I had ever received resided. And if someone challenged me about something that I said or did back in 1789 or 1802, I could go immediately to the files and bring it out. My library was perfectly cataloged and ordered. I could find any book instantly. I knew where all of my seeds were kept for next year's harvest. They were labeled where I got them. If there were any peculiarities about their germination, if they produced uh, one sort of maize or another sort of corn, I kept the most elaborate organizational charts of everything. When I was in Washington, D.C., I had a chart of all the green grocers where I could find different of my favorite fruits and vegetables at different seasons. I made lists. Uh, my whole life was based upon intense organization. And you will find, if you're not an organized person, that you spend more time looking for things than they can possibly merit. And so being organized every second of every day of one's life and never misplacing anything, never letting anything be out of order is the key to productivity and efficiency. So discipline and organization and also a deep love of ideas of the life of the mind. You know, I was essentially an intellectual and a writer and a dreamer and an articulator. Uh, I baked some bricks. I did some gardening, but I did not fight in the war. I was the penman of the revolution. As president, my, my greatest achievement perhaps was the Louisiana Purchase. I would say keeping peace in a very dangerous time uh, when the Napoleonic Wars had heated up again. But what I mostly was as a president was a master administrator. I took care of every task in the order that it came. And one of my Ten Commandments was never put off to tomorrow what you can do today. And another one was never ask another to do what you can do yourself. I have a couple of questions, Mr. President, involving the ocean. The first one comes from Richard Beck. And he asks, why did you, sir, want to send an expedition to the Pacific coast? Well, I wanted to see uh, if the Missouri River interlocked with the uh, Oregon or the Columbia River. We knew from Robert Gray, who had visited the mouth of the Columbia, uh, what its longitude was. And we knew that it was a mighty river because its discharge was so great. And so it must have watered a very large proportion of the northwestern side of the, of the North American continent. So we knew the mouth of the Columbia, but nobody had, had ascended it to its source. It's a very, very voluminous and strong river would be hard to canoe against its its currents. We also knew the longitude of St. Louis, which is the effectively the mouth of the Missouri. And I wondered if they interlocked in some ingenious way. You know, rivers were roads in my time, and roads were rivers. Our commerce found its way uh, to market in our rivers, the Tennessee, the Ohio, the Mississippi, et cetera, the James. And so I thought if I sent an expedition all the way up Missouri to its source, or at least to the head of its navigation, and then that party of men crossed over whatever the Cordillera was, whatever the Continental Divide might be, and I hoped it was a low one, and then found waters of the other river system, the Pacific watershed, my hope was that they would so interlock that the distance of portage for, say, a bateau or a canoe from one navigable river, the Missouri, to the other navigable river, let's call it the Columbia, would be a day or half a day or at most a few days. That was my hope. 
And I wanted to establish that for the purposes of commerce. You know, we wanted to get in on the fur trade, which the, the British had dominated in, in what's now called Canada. And they still had forts, by the way, in the United States, which greatly troubled me because that was a direct violation of the Peace Treaty of 1783 and the Jay Treaty of 1794. But I also felt that if we could find a water artery across the continent, we could get involved in the China trade. And the China trade involving peltries was extremely lucrative. It was, in a sense, part of the first global industry, the, the fur and beaver trade global economy. And I didn't want to yield this to the British. I wanted to harvest these pelts ourselves and get them to China for that lucrative trade. So those were the main purposes from a commercial or constitutional point of view of the Lewis expedition. My private interest was much more literary, um, if you take literary in a very broad sense. I, I wanted Mr. Lewis to conduct a a Linnaean scientific inventory of the American West. The, here was this gigantic blank spot in every map. There were 2,000 miles that were literally marked terra incognita, unknown lands. And I wanted a an intelligent man with a good pen and a sharp uh, sense of observation to go out and take a look. And, and, and maybe he would find uh, the woolly mammoth or the mastodon. He certainly would find animals never before cataloged in science new plants, some of which may have ameliorative effects for human health, native peoples. You know, we knew that there were Indians all over the West, but most of them had never been encountered by a, a person of European or American constitutional extraction. And so I wanted him to meet with these peoples and bring back this rich database because the Enlightenment, the era in which I grew up and in which I exemplify, I think, uh, the Enlightenment was about data collection, about learning new things, cataloging the clouds, a taxonomy of books, a taxonomy of the elements, new ways of, of dividing one plant from another and one animal from another. All of this work of, of classification, uh, observation, discovery, and dissemination by way of publishing, this was central to the purposes of the Enlightenment. And I wanted us to establish ourselves not just as a nation of freedom, but a nation that took its place amongst the enlightened nations of the world. And so Lewis was sent there as the emissary of the Enlightenment as much as he was looking for a, a good water route from, say, Pittsburgh all the way to the Pacific coast. To return to this man's question, Mr. Jefferson, the, the, the Louisiana Purchase did not actually go all the way to the Pacific coast, did it? No, I purchased the entire watershed of the Missouri Basin from Napoleon. So it was your curiosity as well then? Well, I knew in the long run we would extend our western boundaries all the way to the Pacific. You know, I called it an empire for liberty. There's a great deal of commercial interest behind these these explorations as well. Of course, and and commerce is is specifically mentioned in the Constitution of the United States as a federal power, and so I was able to to persuade Congress to fund the Lewis expedition because I said that it was a commercial enterprise. That's not altogether true. It was more of a philosophical, literary, geographic enterprise, but I, but it certainly had commercial implications. Again, that question came from Richard Beck. Mr. President, we need to take just a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And Mr. Jefferson, before we took our break, I said I had a couple of questions involving the ocean. The second comes from Becky Osborne, and she would appreciate it to if you would take some time to talk about ocean voyages that you undertook and maybe even share recollections of others. Uh, I don't think people during my time understand just how uncomfortable and dangerous those type of voyages were. Oh, my. I only did two. Uh, I went to France with my daughter Martha in 1784 in July. And we were on a boat that had only had one or two previous excursions across the Atlantic. But it was so cramped uh, and so uncomfortable that it, it truly would be regarded as an ordeal in your time. We actually had to crawl into our quarters. We had the best quarters on the ship, but there was no way to enter them at standing up. We had to actually crawl on our hands and knees as if into a cave. Really? And how, how, how large was your cabin? Uh, puny, uh, just enough for a couple of cots, 
And of course, these were these ships were essentially yachts, but not nearly as comfortable as a yacht. And how long did this voyage take? We had a great voyage going over. I think it was 19 days, which is not a record, but it's certainly one of the faster voyages across the Atlantic. I actually took along a Don Quixote in Spanish and the Spanish dictionary, and I learned Spanish on that trip. I was going to ask you if you were able to take books along. I know you couldn't live without them, sir. I took books. I also took wine and food, uh, non-perishable food to the extent possible. And I kept daily records of the weather and uh, whether we saw dolphins or sharks or whales or whatever, The trying to learn something about the Gulf Stream and and, and and observing waves and trying to make sense of them. So I, I used the time very well indeed. And then we returned in 1789, and this time I was with both of my daughters, Maria and Martha, but also James Hemmings, uh, my black slave, uh, who is now uh, trained in, in French cuisine as a cook, and Sally Hemmings, the famous Sally Hemmings, and some um, some dogs, some uh, beautiful uh, shepherd dogs that I had purchased in Europe, plus 80-some uh, crates of, of purchases, luggage and chairs and uh, carpets and draperies and china and silver and candles and books and you name it, whatever could be had in Paris or Europe, I had purchased often on credit and brought back with me on that voyage in 1789. And that was it. The only other time I was really on the ocean was during the Washington administration. And, and and General Washington took me and Hamilton and a few others fishing off Long Island. And I will say this, um, it was not pleasant. And I was a little bit seasick. But you did enjoy fishing, as I understand. I could fish. Uh, you know, it's not something that I did very often. Uh, but I, you know, being, being confined to a boat is never very uh, satisfying to me. And being confined on a boat with Colonel Hamilton uh, was a bit like being in Dante's Inferno. Mr. President, you might be interested to know that during my time, sir, we people are, uh, they travel by air. They can get to England in a matter of six hours. How long did your voyages take? Well, the first one took 19 days. The second one took, I think, four weeks or more. Uh, and you also said that you brought along food. Now, why was that? Well, they didn't really provision these ships very well, and I am very particular about the food that I eat. I'm essentially a vegetarian. On board a, a ship going from the United States to, say, Southampton or London, uh, you might have hardtack. Uh, there might be salted pork, or salted beef, uh, sauerkraut. That was something that Captain James Cook introduced to prevent scurvy. Um, maybe some fresh fr- fruit, but not much. The water was stale. So if you wanted to eat well, you had better bring your own food. And I certainly brought my own wine, which, by the way, I shared out uh, with the others. There were only a handful on that ship in 1784. So I I suppose I was a little bit uh, particular. But uh, anyone who actually ate the food that was served on ships, moldy cheese, often with maggots in it, uh, would want to carry their own food if they could afford it. I would imagine that just just the process of preparing foods and wrapping them or however you would store them was a job in itself. In age before refrigeration. So the way you preserve meat was to salt it or to smoke it or to cut it into thin slices and jerk it. And that was it. You could you could brine it, I suppose, that you know, kind of a corned beef. But it was hard to preserve meats. And that's why so much bacon uh, was carried on almost every uh, voyage because bacon has a long capacity to survive uh, because of the way that it it has been prepared in in advance. Actually, I don't know if you know this. I don't think I've ever said this in the whole history of the Thomas Jefferson. But I actually invented a little cooler. Uh, I invented one of the first coolers, and it was a tin box. And it had some uh, insulating material in it, wool. And then you could take a little piece of ice and put it in slivers between the walls, the separate walls. Oh and it, it wasn't very efficient by your standards, but it was not bad. And I used to be able to carry butter from one of my farms to another in this little first cooler. But during your time, Mr. Jefferson, ocean voyages were... Well, you didn't really know if you were ever going to hear from that person again. They were dangerous. They were. Not only did these yachts go down, 
in in storms uh, or or drift because this was really before we had latitude and longitude in any significant way, particularly longitude, or or hit a reef or rocks. But also there were pirates. Um, I, we lived in a time of world war between France and Britain. Uh, you know when Captain Cook traveled to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus in the 1780s, it was our own Dr. Franklin who worked hard in international circles to make sure that Cook would not be molested in his travels, that he was traveling purely for a scientific purpose. He was really a citizen of the world, not of Great Britain. And Franklin worked hard to make sure that nobody would molest Captain Cook's ships as they made their way to the faraway Pacific island of Tahiti, uh, where at a place he called Point Venus, he actually observed the the very rare transit of Venus, and he was one of the people who created the Tahitian myth of the naked, Edenic people who lived without wants and without clothing, and who who were free with their sexual expression and uh, unashamed of their nakedness, and and healthy in the most profound way, and living in something like a perfect state of nature. He helped to create the myth of Tahiti, which continues in some respects all the way to your own time. We have another question, sort of ocean-related, Mr. President. It comes from Irwin Weeks. Uh, He writes, when Mr. Adams was sailing to Europe on a privateer, it was chased by a British warship. Mr. Adams picked up a musket and exclaimed, they will not hang me. I will die fighting. And after the ship outran the the warship, the privateer captain exclaimed that he thought Mr. Adams a soft lawyer, but, quote, now I think better of him. I know I know this story. And he, his question really is, did you realize the king wanted to hang you and Mr. Adams? Oh, of course. Uh, you know, there was a bill of attainder. We were on a proscription list. People who were American revolutionaries, had we been caught, uh, it would have been uh, difficult for us. I don't know that we necessarily would have been killed. But maybe uh, being hanged and quartered and and uh, our heads displayed on the Tower of London or on the on London Bridge, this was a distinct possibility. I never really thought that was very likely to happen, but it certainly wouldn't have been a good thing to be caught. And, and I know this voyage of Adams. He crossed the Atlantic many more times than I did and often under very difficult circumstances, not just from storms. He had several storms, which he thought might be the end of him, but also this this encounter. And he did take up a musket, and, he, you know, and, and to use the term of my time, he, he planned to sell his life as dearly as possible. Uh, there was a kind of a wonderful directness and bravery uh, to Adams. I would have been more likely to try to negotiate. Uh, but at any rate, I can tell you that on my return journey in 1789 with my daughter and with uh, the Hemings um, family, we got to Norfolk, and we, when you do, the ship stays in the harbor, and you take a small craft in to the shore, and then your effects are unloaded a, a day or a few days later. We got to shore, and the ship caught on fire, and all of my personal luggage was there. I mean, gigantic number of purchases from my time in France, ruinous if it had been lost, without proper insurance of any sort, and my books and papers, my diplomatic papers, and uh, things of enormous importance to me are on that boat, and, and we're watching helplessly from the shore as it burns, thinking that we'll never see any of this again. But they were able to remove my personal effects and get them to shore, a few of them a, a bit damaged, but for the most part intact. But that was, you know, the, 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 the burden of the letter is it's a dangerous business to cross the Atlantic in the age of Captain Cook or the age of the American Revolution, and that is certainly the case. Well, finally, Mr. Weeks uh, ends his letter with uh, these occurrences with Mr. Adams. Uh, they left a mark. He remembered. It said in uh, 1798, Alexander Hamilton was begging him to enter the war and to be on England's side, and Adams replied, quote, General Hamilton, your England tried to hang me. <laughs> Adams always had a flair for the self-dramatic, it's probably true. I don't think they would have hanged him. I think they would have tried him. You know, when I went to England at Adams' request in 1786 to negotiate for a commercial treaty and to meet with the Tripolitan pirates, the the diplomats from uh, from Tripoli and, and Algeria, uh, 
we met the king. I was presented to the king of England, George III. Adams had done this himself long before as part of his diplomatic uh, ceremonials. But he took me along to one of the king's levees, these kind of awkward ceremonies that occur periodically under monarchies. And the king, when he came to me, turned his back. I, he refused to greet me or shake my hand or even bow. He turned his back mulishly as if uh, he blamed me for the American Revolution just because I wrote the Declaration of Independence. But nothing could have been more rude or, or, or unnecessary than George III holding me accountable for the American Revolution. The, the British lost North America, all except, of course, for Canada, because they were inept, because they mismanaged their empire, because they taxed us without our representation or consent, because they created punitive regulations and legislation for no good purpose. They tried to use us as a, as a cash register for their own imperial designs, but if they had behaved with even minimal decency, we would have remained faithful subjects of the, of the British crown. I have another letter here from a Stephen Veheran, and a, he enjoyed your reading recently on the uh, 4th of July. You read the Declaration of Independence, in you its recall, ent- In its entirety. Yes, yes. and um, he was glad to find out how long it took you to write it, but he follows up with, uh, how long did it take you to think about what you wanted to write, which is sort of, I suppose, a difficult uh, question to answer in, in uh, contemporary uh, terms you might say I spent my whole life preparing well, for precisely. that. Precisely. I was 33 years old and a little more. I was one of the youngest members of the Second Continental Congress. I was the youngest member of the Virginia delegation, to be sure. I had uh, gone to private schools taught by Scots Presbyterians and Scots Anglicans in my district. And I had been sort of a self-starting student. I read uh, voraciously, 10, 12, sometimes 15 hours a day. I knew seven languages, three ancient and four modern, including uh, Latin with great proficiency and Greek with considerable skill. I had read more or less the corpus of the Enlightenment, Montesquieu and Dolbach and Rousseau and Voltaire and Hume and Dr. Johnson and Bolingbroke and Milton and so on. And so I had read more or less what there was to read that is known under the rubric of the Enlightenment and taken very deep notes and committed uh, passages to my commonplace book and, and done a lot to create outlines so that I would not forget those things that I had learned. And I often digested what I read. So you read it and then you, you, you write a precy of it and in the style of Dryden or in the style of Chaucer or in the style of Addison and Steele or, for that matter, in the style of Dr. Franklin. And so I had really mastered the world of the Enlightenment and ancient um, constitutional debates and talk about liberty and the rights of man and the Roman Republic and the Greek experiment in, in real democracy. And so I had digested all of that in a very – systematic and disciplined way. Everything I did, I tried to do with great discipline and, and mastery. And so I had all of that. And so when the moment came in the in the summer of 1776, and the committee of five devolved into a committee of three, and then Franklin dropped out and Adams came to me and said, you must, you must write this declaration, sir. Uh, when I did it, I was carrying all of that with me in my head. I didn't need to consult book or pamphlet, because I had done all of this preparatory work. And let me give this as a piece of advice to anyone who might be listening to us. Always be the best prepared person in every room you ever go into. Good advice, Mr. President. Um, another political question, if we might. Nowadays, in during my time, sir, we, we have a great discussion about immigration in America um, and our rules and uh, you know, uh, how that works. I a student of history, it's easy to see that a leader of a country that wants to whip up support can can use immigration. But there are those who have serious concerns about what it will do to our economy, um, uh, the possible crime that can come with immigration. And Ken Jones writes in uh, with a, a straightforward question. He wants to know, what was your policy on immigration? Well, first, let me say that these debates are eternal. Uh, they have uh, been divisive since the beginning of our republic. 
Let me remind you that in 1798, during the war scare with France under something that's known historically as the Quasi War, an undeclared naval war against revolutionary France, the Federalists and the Adams administration passed the Alien Sedition and Naturalization Laws. The Alien Law allowed the president to expel from this country anyone he regarded as a security risk without any due process of any sort. So you, you regard that as, as an offshoot from concerns about immigration. Right. So the, so the president could expel from this country anyone who was foreign-born that he regarded as a security threat without due process. And that was because there was a concern that that French uh, radicals were coming here as refugees from the French Revolution, and they would stir up radical politics in the United States and end and, and, and federalist rule. And there was also the naturalization law that was passed during this, this moment of, of, of panic. And the naturalization law extended from five to 14 years, the amount of time you needed to spend here before you could become a citizen. So think of that. You come in, in the age of 40 to this country uh, wanting the American dream. You have to wait 14 years under the naturalization law before you can become a full citizen of the United States. These were palpable violations of the Bill of Rights. They were worthy of the 8th or 9th century. They were appalling because they showed that even under our system of constitutional guarantees and a Bill of Rights, that the first time there was really an international scare, we panicked, the Federalists panicked, Adams panicked, and they produced these, uh, these Dark Ages laws that were fundamentally in violation of the Bill of Rights, and they were signed by the president, John Adams, I blame him for that, and they were not reviewed by the Supreme Court, so where is the court when you most want it? Luckily, they had a sunset clause and they expired. There was one country in the world and one only with a constitution, a Bill of Rights, room enough for the hundredth and the thousandth generation in land, a nation that prided itself on individual liberty and, and self-actualization. and. We wanted people who, who were enchanted by that, who believed that that was the, the, the way the world should work. We wanted them to come here. Thank you very much, Mr. Jefferson, for another enlightening conversation. I so appreciate your insight. You are most welcome, sir. Right now, we're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And now we shall shift our conversation to one with the gentleman who portrays President Jefferson when he's here, the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Hello, my dear friend, David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And proud of it. Uh, We have some more listener questions that I'm going to go to, unless you have a declaration you'd like to make before we do that. Just great questions. I love it when we do listener questions. Me too. The ones about the ocean, I don't think we've really covered before, and it was fascinating to me to hear Jefferson talk about that cramped little yacht that he was on. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because one of them came from Becky Osborne. Does that ring a bell? Yes. And do you remember what she sent us? No. She sent some Chesapecton Jeffersonius fossil scallop shells. Oh, of course, shells. the scallop shells. Yes. Yeah. I have them in my living room, which is my cabinet of curiosity. Thank you for sending the shells. And because, you know, Jefferson in Notes on Virginia did this long thing about whether shells were formed on the mountains uh, because of the high seas or whether they were formed by some spontaneous uh, creative juices in the earth. Thank you. And she says, P.S., should you decide to cover this subject, the ocean voyages, uh, would it be possible to receive a text as to when it will air? Yes, uh, of we'll course. We'll see what we can do about that. Um, she it, Really, her letter asked if we could devote a segment to it. and About the ocean. R- about voyages and stuff. I thought Jefferson did pretty well. So what's coming is what I have in front of me now. Okay. And that would be... Sounds ominous. Errors and corrections. What did we do? I have a feeling that it was my error. I hope error. so. You I would, hope so. Yeah. I can't imagine you would do this, but it comes from Laurel. Um, she didn't give me a pronunciation guide, but I think it's Tassiri Mokas. Or wow. Tassiri, yeah, Tassiri Mokas. Anyway, Laurel writes... Uh, Just a comment, gentlemen, regarding today's broadcast. Uh Uh-oh. As you claim to be historically accurate... (laughs) I love those subordinate clauses. 
John Hancock was not from New York, but from Massachusetts. It, that was you. It must have that been. That was you, David. I remember I, that. I, I You should have corrected me. A little me. bell went off in my brain, thought, nah, but it didn't matter. Well, you know, it's... <laughs> John Hancock Insurance is from New York. Right. He's from Massachusetts, of course. No excuse. Yeah, he was born in Braintree, now Quincy, Massachusetts. Which is where John Adams was from. Uh, on January 23rd, 1737. And he died October 8th, 1793. And what is our corrector's name? Age 56. And he was a pretty wealthy man. He was very wealthy. He was worth $350,000 in those days when he, when he died. Laurel... To Sarah Mokas. Laurel, thank you. Yes. We always want corrections. And of course it was and my you're right. fault. Well, I'm I so think sorry. in this case, I actually think it was. Normally I count it's me. on you I, to, I, to save me from I was, these embarrassments. I was trying to think, I'm going to have to read the Declaration of Independence. I'm going to have to read the Declaration of Independence. So I was not paying close attention. Anyway, I really appreciate the correction, and I am so sorry, sorry for Laurel. my What else? Error. What else here? Well, I wanted to revisit a letter we answered in an earlier episode from Deanna Wallach, because we got several more people pointing this out, but she had written, I wanted to drop a line of protest. When Clay protests the Post and the Times showing favoritism towards the Clintons, um, I was indignant. Oh, right. The New York Times has long been one of, if not the most anti-Clinton mainstream publications, ignoring the Breitbarts and Foxes of the world. Um, so I'm coming back to this because we've had a couple of more people point that error out she was the first i understand that and i i see some merit in that but let me just say this is there any thoughtful american who does not realize that there is a left bias to our major media that the the major networks also cnn certainly msnbc the los angeles times the washington post the new york times that there is a that the our media is largely populated at the reporter level, by people who are left of center, and there's no question in my mind that that is the truth. Well, I would have to say prove it. There is a lot of media consumed in America, and I don't know anybody who can accurately do a, this much is left, this much there is right. There are studies by the Annenberg School that show that there is, in the reporter class, not in the ownership class necessarily, but in the reporter class, there is a majority of people who regard themselves as progressives, liberals, and Democrats. And you know what the best is? What? In my opinion, the best news in America is NPR. They used to have a reputation for being liberal and leftist. Uh -huh. You listen to it now, you get more thoughtful and articulate and evidence-based analysis of the news on NPR than on any other station or broadcast that I know uh, of. BBC is very good, too. BBC is great, and also PBS. The news hour. Well, as I said, we, we've answered this question before, but because we got a couple more inquiries, I thought we'd revisit it. And Deanna did give us some very nice words of encouragement at the end, uh, especially talking about its ongoing encouragement of cross the aisle goodwill. So thank, thank you, you, Deanna. Well, I, I asked her to look into this. I'm, I'm willing to, to stipulate, that is to accept what she's saying about the Times anti-Clinton bias. And here's one more. This one comes from Lucy Roper. Hi, Lucy. Subject, Trump. Message, why is the main focus of your program so partisan against Donald Trump? I will say this. We're broadcasting this just a day or two after the— yeah, We were pre-recording some shows because you're off to visit Lewis and Clark land. First of all, the show is not about Donald Trump or the current presidency or the current political situation. I'm always reluctant to be drawn into that because for several reasons. First of all, we like the fact that our listeners are all over the map— politically. Uh, there are right-wing Republicans who revere Jefferson and there are left-wing progressives who revere Jefferson and everything in between. And there's room enough for everyone because Jefferson stands for liberty in a kind of idealistic abstract sense. And everyone does in some sense, I think. And I don't want to uh, align ourselves with this party or that party or this faction or that. But I will say this. I do think that Donald Trump is the most dangerous person who has ever held the presidency in my lifetime and maybe the most dangerous person in our national history. He deliberately attacks American basic institutions. He uh, says that the, the media is our enemy when we know that that cannot possibly be okay, true. Okay, I take et cetera, your point. Et cetera, In other I words, I am listening to him and he is saying things that are dangerous to the very idea of the restraining mechanisms that are required in a democracy. 
let me let me say this: when Barack Obama, whom I did not greatly admire, um, repeatedly began to rule by executive order, I was uh, offended by this I because the that. Constitution does not grant the president the right to legislate with his pen. And he actually said, "I'm going to legislate." With my pen and a lot of the DACA stuff that we're involved in, he when he was when this first came to him, what are we going to do about the children of immigrants who happen to be born here or were brought here by their parents? He said, "I can't do anything about this because the president doesn't have that power." And when he saw that Congress wasn't going to do anything about it, he changed course and said, "I am by executive order." He cannot. No president can do by executive order things that are legislative in their purpose and in their legitimacy. And he did, they all do, but he did more than most. Donald Trump has done his fair share. This is about the Constitution of the United States, due process, decorum, presidential behavior. Let me say this to all those who are listening. I know we sound as if we're anti-Trump. I am anti-Trump, and here's why. I've been reading a book on 1961. It was the year of the Berlin crisis. It's the year that the Berlin Wall went up, and we came very close to a nuclear exchange. We came as close as we were going to come, except for one other time, which was the next year, the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was a an earth-shattering moment, and everyone was poised to think, is, is this going to be it? Are there going to be tens of millions of people killed in the next few weeks? And here's what happened. John Kennedy was president. He prepared for 40 or 50 or 60 hours before he had a meeting to talk about what we should do. He had the best and the brightest write memos. Henry Kissinger wrote memos. Dean Rusk wrote memos. Acheson wrote memos. And Kennedy exhausted this and asked all the right questions and grounded it in history and understood what was at stake. You don't think that's happening now? Absolutely not. There's not a single person in the United States who believes that President Trump prepares in that way, ever. He's He works from the gut. Maybe people like that. But John Kennedy, who wasn't the greatest president in American history, but he represents what you need from a president, which is these are serious matters. You need to be well briefed. You need to read. You need to listen. You need to digest. You need the best advice from the best people. Well, professional politicians do that. Donald Trump is not a professional it's politician. It's not his style, and it's going, and it's it's dangerous, is my Lucy, point. I hope that dangerous. That, I hope that that helps you, and if you'd like us to talk about this more— um, or have a, have a comment, go to jeffersonhour.com. Ask uh, President Jefferson or Clay a question. It's not Trump's policies that concern me. It's his managerial indifference to the norms of what a president must do in a highly complex and dangerous world. I've worked you up, but I'm sorry. Uh, we need to close the conversation. Yes, I refuse to believe this is about Trump. It's about presidents. We need to close this conversation. Yes, indeed. And, and be uh, cheerful. Because now it is time for this week's Jefferson Watch. You have all heard about the cultural tours I lead from time to time, especially the annual Summer Lewis and Clark Tour. I leave tomorrow for Missoula, Montana, where I will catch up with 25 people, almost all of them Jefferson Hour listeners, who have signed up for this year's adventure through the White Cliffs section of the Missouri River and the Lolo Trail, on which Lewis and Clark made their transit of the Bitterroot Mountains between the watersheds of the Missouri and the Columbia Rivers. Every year I leave for this trip kicking and screaming, since I have so much work to do here. The key to understanding me, if that interests you at all, is that I always take on more than can reasonably be accomplished, so there's always some strain in my life. But the minute I get out on the water at a place called Coal Banks Landing, east of Fort Benton, Montana, I begin to breathe again and to become human again. By the time the trip is over ten days later, I'm restored to sanity. I'm back in my body as a complete human being, and I have fallen in love again with the American landscape as if for the first time. I don't know what my life would be without these annual journeys, but I know it would be a diminished thing in some essential way. This year, I have a great deal on my mind. I won't burden you with the details, but suffice it to say that for me, as for everyone else, life is what happens while we are making other plans, as John Lennon put it. And I cannot help feeling that we have put our great republic into the hands of the single most dangerous man in our national history. Stay tuned, but that for another day. So I contacted our great outfitter, Wayne Fairchild, of Lewis and Clark Trail Adventures in Missoula, Montana, and asked him if he could supply me a solo kayak rather than a canoe this year. 
I will ply the Missouri alone in my kayak this time around, something I have never done before. The river is running high, a huge snowpack in the Rockies last winter. The days will be hot, 90 degrees at 3 p.m., maybe 75 at midnight. I want to drift like a pine log down the great tide of the Missouri, letting the river do the work, musing, gazing, daydreaming, reflecting, planning, grieving, regrouping, possibly even rebooting, just being for a change. I'll stay with the group, of course, but I will try to be out on the periphery so that I hear their laughter at a distance and the low rumble of conversation but without hearing any of it distinctly. If there is a heaven on earth, it is on the second day of this annual river trip. After a good breakfast, we get out on the water, still placid because it is morning, and drift down past an igneous plug known as La Barge. About a half mile downriver, we turn our canoes around to gaze upriver. We do this because at that moment, we realize that we camped last night literally in a Carl Bodmer painting from 1833. It is one of the Swiss artist Bodmer's most beautiful paintings, Google it, The Stone Gates, and we spend the night in the heart of that painting. I have always wanted to stop to take photographs of this primordial scene from the shore. This year in my kayak, I will be able to do that without disrupting anybody else. Later in the day after lunch, I like to drift as if there were no clock in the world, as if there were no deadlines, no meetings, no calendar, as if there were no destination, no hunger, no thirst, no desire, no anxiety, no home, no restlessness, no job, no cable bill, no Congress, no internal combustion engine, no complexity. For an hour, I become something like a pure being, just completely content to exist in a timeless landscape in a timeless way. It is paradise, and I live for it. This is the last tour I will be making with my old dear friend Becky Colley of Lewiston, Idaho. Don't get me wrong, there will be many more tours, including the annual Lewis and Clark Trek. But Becky and I are moving in different directions, and this is the last time we will ply the river together or make the thrilling Wendover Death March together. You know Becky because she is the one who always tries to drown me in the Missouri River. We have always been canoe partners, she in front, I in back. We squabble the whole way down the river because she likes to stop paddling often and without warning, to look around at the gorgeous scenery, to put on lip balm, have a sip of water, or take off the outer layer of her river clothing, or notice a tree, or a butterfly, or a bird, or dip her handkerchief in the water, or take a picture, or pray, or praise, or parse. I grumble, because it really does take two people to move a canoe forward. It seems to me that one should be permitted to take only one lip balm break per hour, but Becky thinks you should apply lip gloss whenever you feel the need. Eventually, my kvetching causes her to tip the canoe over in hope of drowning me once and for all. I somehow always survive, but whatever is in my book bag, books, for example, some of them expensive or important to me, cameras, memory discs, notebooks, maps, aspirin, all that dies in the river, and she says some version of la-di-da, and the assembled tour participants erupt in Homeric laughter. I will say only this of Becky. She is one of my dearest and truest friends in a world where true friendship is rare. I have loved Becky for more than 20 years in the best way of love, agape, without possession, desire, or expectation. We have explored parts of America together. We have propped each other up through divorce, triumph, loss, grief, gladness, success, and failure. And there is a kind of same-time next-year quality to our love and friendship that has made all the difference in my life, and I'm guessing in hers. Becky has a heart the size of Texas. She is happy, I don't know why, and she brings happiness to everyone she meets. She has been one of the handful of most important people in my life's journey, and as the Grateful Dead put it, what a long, strange trip it's been. Goodbye to Becky. We will meet as we always do, but not on the Lewis and Clark Trail or in Jefferson's, Virginia. You never did drown me, dearest. I'm going to continue doing this trip until my body breaks in half on the Wendover hike, some 15 years hence, or 20. I've coughed up a lung so many times on that hike that I don't know what my life would be like without it, but it would be diminished, and I would then truly be old. I will think of all of you, my dear and faithful Jefferson Hour listeners at the Smoking Place, 
at the top of the Rocky Mountains where on the return journey in 1806, Lewis, dear, uptight, driven, mission-obsessed Meriwether Lewis, gave permission to his young Nez Perce guides to stop and smoke the pipe for a safe and holy journey to the Buffalo Plains of Montana. And Becky, a hundred thousand thanks. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.